It is so great to be here with you guys. Um, wow. I just, I got to be here at the first service and um, it's just such a joy to look out and see your faces and to get to be back here. I was here in March at the women's conference and I got a chance to um, speak with you all then and share some amazing time with you. A lot of you know my husband, Chris Harrison, um, and he's been here. If you know my husband, Chris, would you raise your hand? Or if you know me? So I know who I'm talking to. Okay, so I've got a, I've got a group of friends here. How wonderful. Um, if you don't know me, again, it's Rebecca Harrison, and I'm a pastor with my husband. We are church planters. Uh, well, we've been pastors for a long time, but we are just set out on a new adventure to plant a church in Houston, Texas. Um, this is a gospel-centered, multi-ethnic church in the heart of Houston, Texas called Kingdom Story Fellowship. And then we are in the beginning stages of that, and you guys have been an amazing um, source of support for us in prayer. And um, I don't know, some of you know that we were flooded out in Hurricane Katrina right after we got there. And your prayers have meant the world to us. And your um, just, we just have felt like you've been uh, behind us through all of it. And it has made the world of difference. So to let you know, we, um, we finally are in our own house now. And um, that's huge. It took us about nine months to get ourselves reorganized and figure out exactly where we needed to be in the city and what that um, location needed to be. So you guys have been a huge part of praying for us and we just thank you for that. Um, Pastor Andrew and Stacy, we have been friends with them for 14 years. 14 years of Andrew. <laughs> yeah. Um, and he has, uh, I love your pastor. I love Andrew and Chris and here are um, just best buds. And uh, I'll tell you, I love Andrew because he is exactly what you see. He is a man who loves Jesus. He is, has such integrity. And uh, in 14 years, he has never slowed down for one second. <laughs> uh, it's amazing to watch him and I just love him. So. I am really honored to come and be here to be part of the series because I've been listening online and um, watching you guys and watching his sermons and I'm just so impressed. It's just been incredible. So it's a great honor to get to be here and share number four in this series. And really, I'm just going to I'm going to do a little recap. We're going to set up number four, and I'm going to give you one way um, that to respond um, by joining something I'm really passionate about. Um, so let's dive in, shall we? Okay, number four of the nine. Um, I want to just reiterate what the purpose of this series is for those of you who um, maybe haven't been here though the whole time, um, but just to remember and get us all facing in the same direction. Why are we doing this series? Why are we looking at these Beatitudes? The purpose of this series is that the world is longing for a change. We need a change. The world is searching for a counterculture. They're longing for God. They're longing for where is God in all of this? And sadly, too often, they don't look at the church. They say, I already did that. I already looked there, and I did not see anything that looked like God. Those are harsh words. Um, this is a lot of where Jesus is at as he's talking to his disciples in this sermon. People had been looking for a counterculture, looking for something to fill, looking for a way to connect, looking for purpose and meaning, and they looked everywhere, and here's Jesus. And he says, this is what this is going to look like. So the challenge and the words that he gives to his disciples in this Sermon on the Mount are meant for us. This Sermon on the Mount lays out this foundation of what this counterculture, this kingdom culture, will look like lived out through a people who are redeemed and restored and forgiven. People just like us. Freed and filled with the Holy Spirit to go out and be those hands and feet of Jesus in the world. It is you. So these words are for you. They're for us. Andrew describes the Beatitudes as the attitudes that are a way of being, and it's a great way for us to kind of put our heads around this. They're attitudes that align us with Christ, that lead to actions, which done consistently over time become attributes 
that actually identify us as Christians. Okay, it's a lot of words. I'm going to say that a little, a little differently one more time. When we look at what Jesus is teaching us, we cultivate these attitudes. They will lead us to actions that done consistently over time are going to develop in us these attributes that define who we are as Christians. The world is longing for God and Jesus sends us. The world is longing for God and Jesus sends us into this broken world, into all of the mess, into all of the all of our community and says, here I am through these people. So these words are for us and uh, Jesus' assumption is that when the world sees us, the world will say, ah, I knew that God could be merciful and compassionate, could hear me, could see me, could value me. I knew that it could be like this. That's what Jesus is assuming as he speaks to his disciples, that yes, it's a blessing to be the people of God, but it's challenging. So we're going to read the scripture and, uh, and dive in. Starting with Matthew 4.23, if you have your Bibles, um, follow along in your Bibles. I'm using the translation that you guys have, the New Living Translation, and Andrew always says if you don't have a Bible that he'll get you a Bible, so I imagine that if you are new here and you don't have a Bible, one of these elders is going to get you a Bible. I see them in the back. Matthew 4.23, Jesus traveled through the region of Galilee, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. And he healed every kind of disease and illness. News spread about him as far as Syria, and people soon began bringing to him all who were sick. And whatever their sickness or disease, or if they were demon-possessed or epileptic or paralyzed, he healed them all. Yeah, news would spread pretty fast if that, when that's happening. When amazing things are happening, news spreads. As you guys deal with the storm, as you guys are people of God who are working in Habitat Humanity, for who are engaging this world, engaging your community, news about what God is doing spreads fast. So large crowds followed him wherever he went. People from Galilee, the ten towns, Jerusalem, from all over Judea, and from east of the Jordan River. So one day, as he saw the crowds gathering, Jesus went up on the mountainside, and he sat down. His disciples gathered around him, and he began to teach them. And here's what he taught them. He said, God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him. Some of our translations would say, God blesses the poor in spirit. For the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the earth. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. So we're going to just do a little recap of these first three because we've got to these uh, are not, to, you can't separate them. In order to get to number four, you have to be sitting really firmly in the first three. So we're just going to do a tiny recap of that. And I want to remind us that one of the first things I heard Andrew say was, if we look at this scripture, first there's all these crowds that are around. And he looks at all these people who are wanting to see what's going to happen. What's this Jesus all about? Who, who, who are these people? What new thing is he bringing? What is this new teaching? Does, is he someone who could get me closer to God? I mean, he's healing people. Maybe that could help. But then there's this other group. And there's his disciples. And he goes up on the mountainside and pulls them away and sits them down and says, okay, see all this crowd? I got to teach you something. Because I got to show you how to go out there into that crowd. Now, if you are part of the crowd, I want you to encourage you 
to take a step closer. I want to encourage you to take a step closer because the words that Jesus wants to give his followers are words that he believes into them. When we look at the word um, blessed, it isn't a transactional kind of blessing. It's not saying, if you do this, then you will get this reward. This word of blessing, it's a state of being. He's saying, hey, my people, you are blessed because this is who you are. Even as you're becoming this, this is who you are. This defines you. So he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. And we talked about how being poor in spirit is not being economically poor. It is an equalizing term that says, blessed are you when you realize that you are 100% spiritually bankrupt. On our own, we can do nothing to fill this spiritual hole in our being. But wow, we are blessed to realize that. We are poor in spirit. You're sitting here with me. You're, you're, you are here because you're recognized, wow, I can't do this on my own. I am not God. I cannot be my own God. It doesn't work. I've tried everything. I have meditated. I have done incense. I have prayed to all those gods up on the mountains. I have tried so hard to fill up this void, to make myself right, to make myself do the things I want to do that I know are good, but I can't do it on my own. When we realize that, wow, we are blessed. And he says, blessed are you who are poor in spirit. The kingdom of heaven is yours. This is the entry point. This is the, 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 the basic place where we have to start. We're going to be in this kingdom of heaven where God is the king and we are not. Thank God. I make a terrible king of my life. But God being the king, we start here. We recognize that we are poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And he uses this word mourn, which is a word that we... Ah, we identify with what it feels like to grieve, to hurt, to have a sense of emptiness and loss. But this mourning that he's talking about is not the mourning that comes from bereavement. It's the mourning that comes when we say, I'm a mess. I see how far I am from God. It's the mourning that comes when we mourn our sin. When we face ourselves, it's hard, isn't it? It's hard to look at ourselves and go, ah, I am really far from God. I, in our lives, we have these moments where we confront ourselves and we do a lot of stuff to avoid not confront, to avoid confronting ourselves, don't we? But here's the good news. God says, you are blessed to mourn. Mourn it, grieve it, for you will be comforted. The good news is we look at that cross and we say, I'm forgiven. I can, I can understand my forgiveness when I understand how far I was from God. How deep my sin is, when I look at that cross, wow. That God saved a person like me Wow, uh, that's an amazing comfort. Because there is no sin, there is no nothing we can do that God does not forgive. It's amazing. It is a huge comfort. I'm far from God. I recognize my sin. I am forgiven. And that puts me in a position of humility, <laughs> right? I see, wow, okay. I see who I am. Thank you, Lord, that you have forgiven me. And I fall into this posture of humility. And God says, blessed are the humble, for they shall inherit the earth. And you remember that the other word used here is meek, and that meekness is not, meekness is not weakness. This is intensely countercultural. 
In our culture where we prize status and influence and power and who's the strong one and who can be on top, each man for himself, meekness is not prized. And yet, isn't it interesting that these are our heroes? The one who is the one who is humble, the one who has all this power but controls it, the one who offers himself as a sacrifice, who puts himself last and lets someone else go first, Think about the Avengers. These are our heroes. And the thing that marks them is that every single story, there is a a sacrificing person. Captain America sacrifices himself. Even Iron Man gets there eventually. (laughs) Right? These are our heroes. The world is longing for these heroes. They're longing for someone to say, I will put my desire aside. And I will say that you Go first. In fact, as Andrew put it, we will set our, when we're humble, we set our desire aside in favor of God's directive. Right? The humble, the meek, this is where we actually see power. In a culture where we see the misuse of power all over the place, Jesus says, Blessed are you who are meek, who are humble. Meekness is essentially a true view of oneself. It's a clarity that prompts an attitude toward others. A clarity of ourself. Okay, I get it. I'm not all that. I'm not God, but I am forgiven. And so I can can look out and see the value in every human being. So in that posture, we ground ourselves and our perspective begins to change. We strive to see the world the way God sees the world. We strive to look at other people the way that God sees them. It's only when we get to this place of humility that we can actually do that, right? And we say, not my will, Father, but your will be done. I surrender it to you. So that leads us where we are today. You ready? Okay. So last week, Andrew challenged us with two things, and he said, what is one thing you need to stop doing so that you can start doing what God is calling you to do? And then he said, what do you need to surrender over to God so that you can develop the right perspective or attitude? So we've all done our homework, and we're 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 one more step closer, right? Now that our perspective, our attitude is changing, we come to the Lord in this posture of humility, we surrender, and today we're going to ask ourselves, all right, what do we need to start doing? What do we need to start doing? Give me my marching orders, Lord. Send me, send me, send me. And Jesus says, blessed are you. When you hunger and thirst for justice. Your translation says, God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. That's a good word, satisfied. Yeah? So circle hunger and thirst and justice. Because with this beatitude, Jesus drops this counterculture bomb and he reframes everything. Our entire perspective about every single thing that we're going to do in our lives, in our homes, with God, with one another, and the world is meant to be reframed by, by the time we get to number four. It's amazing. The Greek word used here for justice, other translations will say righteousness. It's diakasune. Say that with me. Diakasune. And Greek words have this kind of dimensionality to them, right? There's multiple dimensions of how we want to look at it. So some trans, you have to, tick, you have to pick an English word to, to, to use in its place. So some translations will say righteousness. Others will say justice. And in this case, justice is this dimension of righteousness 
that is here. So we chose justice. But I want to look for a second at righteousness because I think it helps us get to how do we understand what we're talking about when we talk about justice in this sense. So righteousness with God is never about rightness. Can you say that with me? Righteousness is never about rightness. It's about being in right relationship with God. Our righteousness comes in our right relationship with God. And ultimately that happens in a cosmic sense because of what Jesus has done on the cross. There's nothing we can ever do to earn our way into being right with God. But this sense, this dimension of righteousness where he says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. We are seeking this, what is this right, what is our right position with God? The Pharisees, they, they thought they could earn their righteousness by doing everything right. The Pharisees are these religious bigwigs that were kind of in charge of the temple and they were the, the ones who knew everything and they wore all the fancy robes and they knew really well how to do everything right. And they thought, well, I've done all of these things. I followed the letter of the law and so I am right and you are not. My rightness can be marked by exactly how many laws I have obeyed to the letter and your wrongness can then be marked by how many you have not. So they really thought righteousness could be earned through this right behavior. They got it wrong. And Jesus calls them out on it. They knew how to follow the letter of the law, but they completely missed the heart. Their motives were completely out of whack. They were much more concerned about being right than being like God. When Jesus is talking about righteousness, he is talking about a rightness with God that comes from us aligning our heart to his and then living lives that actually reflect him. So the world that's longing for God, that's longing for a change, should be able to look at the followers of Jesus and say, there's the heart of God. Wow, this mercy, this compassion, this generosity, this self-sacrifice that I long for with God, that I hope that God is like that. I look at his people and I see that. Blessed are you who hunger and thirst for this righteousness. Faith lived out looks like our hearts being aligned with God so that our actions actually reflect who God is. And it's this dimension of righteousness where we translate as justice. God's justice, his sense of justice, oh, it's so different from ours, isn't it? God's sense of justice. God's justice is my favorite kind of description of it. It seeks to make anything that is bent and broken straight. God's justice seeks to bring equity more than fairness. Now, my eight-year-old son is very interested in fairness, okay? Fairness means everything's even. You got five, I got five. If we, if we have a pack of gummy worms and one of them is a little smaller and they don't divide quite evenly and it's like, Caden got five gummy worms and I only got four and it's just a travesty in the whole universe. But that's how we behave, right? Like, I didn't get that much. How come I didn't get that much? I deserve that. How come she got that? I didn't get that. Well, that doesn't make sense. Well, I did more. Well, I, well, I earned more. Well, I worked harder. Our sense of justice is really different from God's. God's justice seeks to bring wholeness and restoration where there is depravity and degradation. It involves mercy. It involves compassion. It's never going to be about rights. It's never going to be about what we deserve. Rightness with God is never going to be about what is right for me. 
it is always going to be about what is right to God. From his perspective of this world that he made, that he is king of. Blessed are you who are poor in spirit, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. We live in a kingdom and we seek to be a kingdom culture that shows the world what the Lord looks like. God's vision for this, we see in Isaiah 40, where we, the mountains become low and the valleys become high. He says, listen, it's the voice of someone shouting. Clear the way through the wilderness for the Lord. Make straight highway through the wasteland for our God. Fill in the valleys, level the mountains and hills, straighten the curves, smooth out the rough places. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed. The glory of the Lord will be revealed. We will see who God is and all the people will see it together. That's a good vision, isn't it? The Lord has spoken. Ah, but Jesus, you know, he doesn't say that we should just kind of like want this. Yeah, it'd be good if things were fair. Wouldn't it be good if things were equal? Too bad they're not. So glad that I'm not like them. I'm so blessed. Isn't that great? I'm so blessed I have so much. I don't know what they did to not deserve that, but I'm good. It's not what he says. He says, blessed are you who hunger and thirst for this righteousness. We should hunger for it, crave it. Crave it. Have you ever had a craving? Anybody ever been pregnant? <laughs> okay, when I was pregnant, I wanted ding-dongs, hostess ding-dongs, and Taco Bell burritos. When my first child, that was all I wanted was Taco Bell burritos and uh, and uh, not that that was, it wasn't good. It wasn't good for me. Um, but when we crave something, we have to have it, right? We just have to have it. Thirst. Hunger and thirst for it. This is not like, mm, gosh, I kind of wish I had a little water. This picture of thirst is to painfully feel the want of something. So Jesus says, blessed are you who hunger and thirst for this righteousness, this right relationship with the world through me. You will be filled as you hunger and thirst. I love he uses these visceral words, these, these words that we know what this feels like. It's feel like in our body. Because our appetites are really strong. Appetites really, really control us, right? The thing about our appetites is that sometimes they're off. Sometimes we crave things that aren't good for us, right? Ding-dongs and burritos were not the best thing to crave. We crave all kinds of things that actually harm us. We crave seeing things that aren't good for us. We crave that website that we hide. We crave closeness with someone who's not our spouse. We crave rightness on Facebook. We crave to be the one who ends the argument and I got my way and I am right. Oh, it feels so good to be right. We crave that. We crave things that harm us. Our appetites can hurt us. We crave addictions that push us away from God. We crave gossip. I just got to tell you. We crave gossip that separates and divides. It might get us what we want in the moment but it will never fill us. It will never, ever satisfy us. It will leave us empty. 
and feeling kind of sick. It's like McDonald's french fries. I don't know what your favorite french fries is. Mine are the Habit Burger, but I crave those, and then I eat them, and then I feel empty. About four years ago, my husband and I did uh, a cleanse. Have you guys ever done a cleanse? So the 30 days and you adjust your diet radically. And uh, when I first got the shopping list, it had just all these things on this list and I was gonna make all these meals. And so we did it, we completely dove in and there were things on that list. There were so many vegetables and I got introduced to kale. How many people actually like kale? Is there anybody? Okay, yeah, okay. So we start eating kale and uh, we eat all, all kinds of things. And at first, it's just, I mean, it's horrible. It's horrible. And the things are coming out of your body and it's just like, oh, it's terrible. And you think this can't possibly be good. This is so inconvenient. This is expensive. This is hard. I want something else. I don't want to do this. But the thing was, at the end of 30 days, our appetite began to change. What we craved began to change. We wanted something that was better for us. And so we sacrificed and our appetites began to change. And we craved different things. I'm not still not a huge fan of kale, but there are certain brands that are good. When our attitude changes, our appetite changes, and our actions change. We hunger and thirst for righteousness. We will be filled. I think a key reason that God uses these particular visceral words of hunger and thirst is actually not, it's not very thinly veiled. He actually wants us, as we develop his perspective for the world, as we adopt his attitude, and our actions begin to reflect him, we develop this attribute, right? We hunger and thirst for this righteousness, for this justice, for those who actually hunger and thirst. We actually develop eyes to see the world and value people the way God does, and we say, there's something not right here and God invites me to step in and to respond. Uh, God began to really change my heart um, and gave me ways to be filled as I, this hunger and thirst for his righteousness began to grow in me. He gave me many ways um, to, to, to fill that. And it began in South Africa when I was there and I was um, working with an, uh, I, I was there, I was making a film, but it was in the middle of apartheid. And apartheid was where people of black and white were legally separated, kind of like we had segregation here, only on a different, uh, much, much, um, a more brutal way. Uh, it's all brutal, it was all wrong, it was all disgusting to God horrible, abhorrent, God hates racism. Hates it. Hates it. You want to get God mad? Yeah. So here I am in South Africa. And there's these white guys in this petrol station over here, and there, it's a gas station. There's a man, and I'm walking in the middle of the street, there's a guy sitting over here on a bench, and he's been beaten up, his face is bleeding. And literally, he's right there, and these guys are right there, and I'm right in the middle. So, who am I? Now, I look like a white South African. Blonde hair, Dutch background. But these guys are just joking around. I'm like, do you see the dude? So I walk over, and I say, can you give me a tissue? They give me one. I said, can I have a few more? Get the tissue, walk over here, here. And this guy looks at me like I'm, I'm crazy. I, 
this is not what you do in this culture. But I got to decide, am I kingdom culture? Am I, who am I? Who am I? Because I know that his value in God's eyes is exactly the same as mine. I know it to be true. So then time goes on and uh, we, there was an orphan crisis in Africa, still is. Um, it had been on my heart for a long time. I really wanted a baby. I really wanted a, a third baby. And uh, I got the opportunity to adopt our son from Ethiopia. Now, adoption is never an answer to uh, the orphan crisis that came from AIDS and civil war and extreme um, poverty in that region. Um, but it was an answer for his mom. When we step in, we are answering the prayers of our brothers and sisters. It's not convenient. I mean, I got, a, I got an amazing child. But what I did was not out of pity. I, I said, I, I want to be a mommy. Well, all I did was say, yes, I will take your place. I will be the mom because you can't be. I will do what you can't do. And that's an honor. You hunger and you thirst for this righteousness and you will be filled and he will continue to give you things to fill you up as you hunger and thirst for this. And if, if about four or five years ago, my husband and I, we started doing Team World Vision and we began to run and build teams to run for clean water in Africa. And I'd worked with World Vision for years and I've also worked with Compassion and, you know, um, we began to do these teams and getting people running for clean water. And the first year we raised 25,000. The next year we raised like 30,000. Next year we raised 40,000. In the end we raised over $125,000. But that equals 2,500 kids getting clean water for life. And, and we got to be in great shape as a result of it. It was like not a hard thing to do. It was simply saying, I'm going to adopt God's perspective because actually there is no us and them. There is only us. And these are my brothers and sisters across the globe. We have one father and we're all adopted equally. So perspective changes. God gives these opportunities to move and to to participate. You guys have an opportunity. You're going to the Dominican Republic tomorrow. That's awesome. Hungering and thirsting. You're gonna get, you're gonna get filled and you're gonna want more. Habitat for humanity. That is awesome. Some of you guys may feel tired today. We worked on a house yesterday. I want more. I want more. I want to see more houses. I want to see this whole community change. I want to see, I want to see global poverty. I want to see global poverty ended. And I believe that's possible because we're people and we can do this. We do not have a lack of, of resources in this world. We do not have a lack of resources in the world. In fact, the, the country my son is from in Ethiopia, they have enough resources in Ethiopia to, filled, to feed Africa twice over. And yet there is poverty and those resources are distributed in wacky ways. So we step in and we participate and we can't do everything, but we can do something. And God will give us this hunger, this thirst for righteousness and we will be filled and we will want more and more. So I'm going to give us in the next five minutes and I'm going to go a tiny bit over. Of course I am, but I'm doing better than last time. Um... <laughs> I'm going to give you an action to join me in. Um, Andrew was kind enough to invite me to come and speak and do this piece. And I told him what I was doing and said, can I wrap this in with this? Because I also got an opportunity to do something else that's really cool. And I want to invite some of you to join me on this team. I got invited to run in the Berlin Marathon. Um, with World Vision, and it's simply this. We're going to get 20 kids sponsored, each of us. There's only 50 of us 
on the team. We only got 50 spots for the whole marathon. So we're gonna each get 20 kids, um, sponsors, and we're gonna run for those 20 kids. You can't pass off that opportunity, right? You gotta do that. The only downside is that I have to now train for a marathon <laughs> in August in Houston. So uh, I'm gonna run in September, and I'm gonna be running for these 20 kids, and I am wanting to find people who wanna join my team and sponsor a kid. 39 bucks. A lot of you already sponsor kids. I sponsor four kids with World Vision, and I sponsor another kid with um, Compassion. Um, my four kids with World Vision are Michigan, Miret, Berhain, and um, who's my fourth one? Sijan um, is my other World, World Vision one. He's in the Philippines. So three of my kids that I sponsor are from the same region that my son Desmond is from in Ethiopia. And I get to watch through their eyes, I get to see how their community is changing and being developed. It's an amazing honor. Um, so if you already sponsor one, you can sponsor two. It's $1.30 a day, less than that. Um, it's a way. God's not going to stop giving us opportunities. So I'm just looking for 20 people to partner with me to join my team so I can run for these kids. But pick a way. What do we need to start doing? I'm gonna show you a video that's gonna talk about this sponsorship, and if you wanna know more about how child sponsorship works and all that, um, and how community development is sustainable, and how that feeds back into us raising up a generation that actually has a global perspective, that cares about those who are actually hungering and thirsting, I wanna to talk to you about that. Because what God invites us into is not just for us. It's not just so that we can check the box and go, oh, I did a good thing. It always fills us. And I can tell you that being a sponsor, when I watch Michigan, she's the same age as my daughter, Dylan. And I get to see a video of her. And I get to see her singing just like my daughter does. And because of what we get to do in partnering with another organization that's doing community development really, really well in the world, they're the number one community development organization in the world doing sustainable work over time. I get to see through God's eyes. What does it look like when I say, hey, Michigan, I see you. I see you, I value you. And it doesn't stop with there, I mean, say yes, and then say yes again, and then say yes again. There is no limit. God will give you the resources you need to be as generous as he is. And he is generous. He's so generous. So let me show the video, and, um, and we'll, we'll move on. <laughs> One, two, three. <laughs> <laughs> it's like God chose Maureen to be my sponsor child. It is unreal how similar we are in our personalities. She is so silly and she's full of energy. She goes 100 miles an hour all the time and people always tell me that about myself. <laughs> she laughs and goops around. She's super outgoing, but she still loves to cuddle and be quiet. So it's literally like God chose her to be my sponsored child. The issue of clean water is huge. Over 700 million people don't have access to clean, safe water. So I thought, you know, maybe if I sponsored a child in Kenya, in a community that doesn't have access to safe water, it would make the issue of clean water more personal to me. When I first came to Bartabwa, there was no access to safe water. People were walking several miles, two or three times a day, just to get water that wasn't even safe to drink. The child mortality rate in Bartabo at the time was 50%. That means kids only had a 50-50 shot of CNH5. And Maureen was only three and a half. 
So she was already on her way to beating the odds, but it left me with a sense of urgency that we need to get clean water to this community. World Vision's child sponsorship program is unique in so many ways. World Vision focuses on tackling the root causes of poverty, things like access to clean water, health care and immunizations, agricultural development and food security, education and literacy, and even economic development. So when I send my $35 a month, instead of simply giving that to Maureen's family, what they do is they pool that money with the money from all the other child sponsors of over 3,000 kids in this community. They pool that money and now they can do large scale community development projects. It's that model that allows World Vision to build schools. It's that model that allows World Vision to do large healthcare facilities. It's that model that allows World Vision to do mind blowing water projects. Instead of just drilling a well right here in Marine's community, World Vision is going to try and tackle the water problem from a holistic perspective. They're going to try and go from zero access to safe water to 100% access to safe water. Not just for Marine, but for over 23,000 people in this community and in communities just like hers all across Africa. God's righteousness is personal. It's personal. Because God loves the world he made. It's personal to him, and he invites us to make it personal to us. And I'm an ambassador with World Vision because I've worked with them for a long time. And so I stand here and I say, hey, I need, I need 20 people to be on my team so I can run for 20 kids. You're not going I want, to, I want some of you to join me today. I really, really do. And I'm going to stand out there and I'm going to hold these little, these little folders and you can see the actual kids. But I may have these folders and I may have these kids. There's other opportunities. God's not going to stop giving you opportunities to step in with him. And I want to tell you, say yes. Hunger and thirst for this. And you will be filled. You know, Jesus actually wants to fill us spiritually, really, with his presence all the time. And today, we have the opportunity to take communion. We're the very presence of our Lord Jesus Christ comes and dwells and is with us. And we get to be a part of his table. We have this communion station set up and you're gonna be able to take communion as you, as you like. But we remember that on the night that our Lord Jesus was betrayed and arrested, he took the bread and he broke it and he said, this bread is my body broken for you. Take and eat this bread. And likewise, he took the cup and he poured the wine and he drank and he said, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood this blood that's shed for you. Take and drink this. As often as you take this bread and eat and drink this cup, you do this in remembrance of me until I come again. And my friends, this world may be challenging and we have a lot to, to step into, but we know the end of this story and he comes again. So let us enjoy communion in remembrance of all that he has done for us, the way that he has come all the way to us, the way that he stands with us, that he advocates with us, and then he invites us in. Oh, we are blessed to be his people. So let us enjoy communion. Can I, can I just pray for us? 
Father, 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 Father. I thank you for this church. I thank you for these leaders. I thank you for Andrew, for Stacy, for Pastor Glenn, for Pastor Mark, for all of the pastors that are here, Father. I praise you, I praise you, I praise you. You're so good. Father, I thank you that you bless us to be your people, and I pray that you will uh, develop in us a hunger and a thirst for your righteousness, for your justice in this world, that the world might look at Country Bible Church and say, there he is. Oh, there is where I see how good God is. We praise you. We glorify you, Lord, in your holy, precious name. Amen.